out. So it's a long uh, pathway to this paper. And originally it was not about the research specialization. Originally it was about the uh, university specialization. So in Russia, when you apply to a university, you apply to a specific department, right? So you want to be an economist, you apply to be an economist, your first year is pretty much fixed, your second year is pretty much the same classes. Uh, your third year, you might get an option, but it's pretty much like economics of this and economics of that. Um, so you get a little bit of electives, but you are an economist. I mean, you wanted to be an economist originally. You got to be an economist at the end of the day. You might transfer. There is not a lot of transfers from, I don't know, economics into social sciences, into anthropology, into history or whatever. So people tend to stay in the same pathway. Same story with the UK. So, um, well, there is like three years of studying in the UK because the final class of the uh, high school is supposed to be preparing you for the university level classes in uh, your further study, wherever they might be. So if you want to do math oriented subjects in the future, you do the math, but um, Again, you choose the specialization in the beginning. I did my PhD in the US and I was teaching undergrads in there. And what surprised me a lot was you don't really need to focus at, at the beginning, right? So the way it works in there is that you have some basic things that you have to learn. I don't know, introduction to economics, introduction to uh, social sciences, uh, um, introduction to communication, right? And if you want a degree, then you need to have a collection of classes, right? So if you want a degree in economics, it must be, I don't know, 20 classes in economics. Out of them, five should be uh, basic, five should be intermediary or higher end, 10 should be, you know, highest level and 10 more classes from whatever. So I took a class in German like I was doing a PhD and I enrolled in a class in German and I studied a little bit of German. There were other classes. There was a class of tasting wines, right? Fine, you could sign up for a class of tasting wines, which is why students sometimes study for more than four years because they sometimes need one more class to finish a specialization. They didn't realize that they needed one or they failed the class so they need to retake it. But it's unclear which method of doing things is better. So this specialization at entrance or specialization of, at, as you study uh, was a thing that I was thinking about for a long time. Then I met a person who was doing that thing, who did some sort of estimates. And I was like, okay, this guy, let, let, let him finish. I kind of need to check whether he finished or not, but yeah, fine. And I mean, it was it was here, right? So I, I was walking around with, with that thing in my head. And uh, I went on the job market in 2016, right? And I went to different places and I was discussing things and I went to Cardiff and there was a final interview with the dean and the dean is like, so what's your resource specialization? And I was like, dude, I have like, I don't know, six years of employment. I have like more papers than like, then you need to get, you know, promoted in your university. You have like 10 years of experience in teaching people. Why do you care about my research specialization? Right? And they do, right? Even in HSC, they ask you, what are you working on? When you look at the advertising that says, we are looking for people, right? It doesn't say like, we are looking for a micro person or a macro person, it says whoever, right? But then you go into the interview and they ask you about your research specialization. It's not HSC specific, it's for everybody. Everybody who ever interviewed me, what surprised me in Cardiff was that it, I was interviewed on a more senior market, right? So when you're junior, right, it, it makes sense to maybe ask you if you understand what's going on, right? When you're senior, when you have publications, you kind of can publish. They, they shouldn't care at that point what are you working on, right? But they do. Right. So 
that kind of reignited this thing back. Uh, the research specialization as a signal of ability story. And the problem with that is that it's a bit hard to discuss that with the usual, you know, uh, like that, like X, Y, you know, in difference curve things that we usually do in our microeconomic analysis. So I had to come up with some other way. Instead, I come up with some other way. I showed that to people in the conference. One of them was Eyal, and I wrote up the paper. I submitted it to letters. He came back uh, saying that my main result is uh, obviously wrong. You must have an equilibrium. And I sent it to Eyal saying, well, look, what, what do you think about it? He says, let's, let's maybe write it together. And I'm like, okay, fine. So we made a little twist and hopefully we'll develop it into something and we'll see where it goes. Right. So that's, that's the story. Every mistake in here is completely mine. AL has not participated yet. I wanted to join, to invite him here, but he's right now, he's presenting something in another Zoom call. So <laughs> unfortunately, the, the, the choice of the 24th of September proved to be impossible to reconcile with AL's schedule. Right, who gets hired? Um, there is research about like people with higher marks are more likely to be hired, people with more achievements are more likely to be hired, people who win Olympiads are more likely to be hired, people who are friends with the guy who is hiring is more likely to be hired. Uh, so far, yeah, no questions. Um, so in junior academic market, there is this interesting phenomenon, well, not interesting. An interesting thing that people care about having a resource specialization. Uh, people, well, the, this, the hardest thing for me to hear was when I was interviewed in one of the places in Australia and uh, a person there said like, I was, they were asking like, what do you work on? And I'm like, here's one paper, here's another paper, here's a third paper. She was like, you can't be a specialist in more than one field. I'm like, why not? I can be, look, here is a paper, here is a paper, here is a paper. Like, well, you won't be able to track the literature. Like, no way anybody can be a specialist in more than one field. And I'm like, fine. <laughs> well, I didn't get a job, but uh, I guess my point is people really do have strong feelings in themselves about people having more than one field. The junior academic market, very important to have this Fields. In my paper, I, I looked at advice. So some people from time to time make a little bit of, you know, advice for junior academics. And in John, the, the, there is the guy called John Coley, C-A-W-L-E-Y. And in his paper, it works like that. So what do you need to do? Number one, know what you're working for, 1.1 know your field, right? So before I, you know, write a good paper, you know, be able to explain it, right? Before that, know your field, know your specialization. He's not even, you know, thinking about people having more than one specialization. And it's not just him. It's, uh, I found, I think, three different sources that I could cite because frequently it's just, you know, a PDF on some guy's website. So this was actually published. This was easy enough to say. So there, there was one PDF that was just called Stanford Professor's Advice. And there was a ongoing seminar for PhD people who go on the market. And whoever was the Stanford person who was in charge of placing students, he, he was updating this PDF. So it was like a history of updates from different people who were in charge of placing Stanford people. So you couldn't really cite it because it was like author Stanford people, right? <laughs> Name, Stanford advice, years, 1995, 2005. I mean, not really a document that's easy to cite with big tech. Right, junior academic market specialization is perceived as a signal of ability. They really care whether you are the specialist in one place or not. Uh, it's not just academic market. I 
heard that if you are going with a master degree and you're looking for a job, having a different undergraduate might hurt you. Like if they are looking for an economist and they see equally able economist and equally able economist master with a math undergrad, they might punish salary wise the math undergrad. Okay. So I, I did not see a paper about that. And if, you know, somebody has deep enough data, here is a good paper to maybe write about that. That could be right, it could be wrong. I, I have nothing to cite in here. So it's not just the problem of academic markets. Like uh, if you always worked in uh, consulting and you want to switch into going into investment banking, clearly you will be worse than a person who was always in investment banking. But do you get a premium for having different backgrounds or having just focused background in investment banking? That's a thing that could be a paper topic as well. If you get the data, right? Um, right. So what we study in this paper is, does it make sense? Does it make sense that people who don't focus are worse than people who focus? Right? And the answer is maybe. So what I am going to do now is I'm going to show you why it kind of does not make sense. Right? Unless you recognize that the game is not just one shot. The game is not over with employment. And as soon as you look at longer game, as long as you include the tenure track after that, then it might make sense, okay? So my part before AL was just about the first part, showing that if the game is over at employment, it does not make sense. AL explained to me how to make it to make sense. And the way to make sense in the academic job market is to consider the tenure track period. Let's go into the model. Any questions so far? I'm not citing a lot of literature because there is not a lot of literature. I mean, there is obviously this advice stuff that uh, it, it Specialization is a bit hard to capture. Like uh, uh, usually people would use something like Herfindahl Hirschman index to capture the heterogeneity of things. Like if you have firms who are working at different kinds of outputs, they would uh, look at the shares of how much, I don't know, how much do you work on soda drinks? How much do you work on crisps? How much do you work on, uh, I don't know, cleaning disinfectants or something. But, uh, with specialization, it's not a terribly good measure, right? So if you have, I don't know, 20 papers in um, econometrics and one paper in micro, it's not necessarily one to 20 that you that, that there are proportions to match. Like if, you, if this one paper is in economic letters and 20 papers are econometric, I, it's not clear why do you like use one to 20 or, or the other way around. If you have one micro econometrica paper and 20 stata journal papers, it's unclear why is it one to 20. So like putting a number on a specialization for an empirical, from an empirical perspective is not straightforward, right? Um, but it's, hard in theory as well. So the way we did it was to make as much a skeleton model as we can and see how it works from there, All right? So the way how it works is that you have two fields, right? At the first uh, draft, it was called micro and macro. I decided to make it more general and call it fields one and two. So fields are completely orthogonal to each other. So uh, you can be good in the field and you can be bad in the field. If you are a PhD candidate, you can be good or you can be bad. And you know whether you're good or bad. 
uh, which is already a strong statement about a lot of candidates, but uh, let's start with that. Right, so they are independent. The chance of being good at the topic is lambda. It's independent. Uh, so if you're good in micro, it's not informative about whether you're good in macro or not. This is not a strong assumption based upon what I saw from the numerical simulations. I did not uh, check it with the actual analysis, but independence helps me a lot and does not seem to be a, be a deal breaker in, in if, you, if you play with numbers. Right, so two fields, micro and macro. Each candidate gets two ideas in each field, two ideas. So each individual, each candidate can be uh, good at topic one, good at topic two, and he can have two ideas. First idea, second idea, first idea, second idea. So these are ideas in topic one and these are ideas in topic two. In principle, I could call this just total number of good ideas in topic one and total number of good ideas in topic two. It's just easier for me when I do the coding to keep it like that. That's why you know, I have the six dimensional type for each candidate. So there is a continuum, measure one of candidates. Some of them are good in topic one, some of them are good in topic two. They get ideas, some of them are good ideas, some of them are bad ideas and candidates choose two ideas to work on and that makes up their CV when they go on the job market. Why can't you work on three ideas? Because everybody knows that three ideas is too much. There is actually a penalty if you have too many working papers on the job market. There is a penalty if you have only one idea. So, I mean, conditional on having two ideas, here is the world, all right? Uh, the reason why I have this weird structure is because originally I was thinking about having a Poisson process and having like that many good ideas, that many bad ideas, that many good ideas, that many bad ideas, and then, you know, sum up over everything and then and see how it works. And I got confused and I scaled down from that into, into this. Right? So the probability of having a good idea, if you are good at the topic, is P. The probability of good idea in the topic, if you are not good at the topic, probability of having a good idea in macro, if you are not good at macro, is smaller. So alpha is smaller than one. So good people don't necessarily have good ideas. Bad people don't necessarily always have bad ideas. Okay, so this guy is bad in micro, bad in macro. He has one good idea in topic one and one good idea in topic two. Okay, would he focus? That depends upon how other people are going to behave. So what the universities want? The universities are looking at the whole population of candidates and they're getting some candidates and let's take the two candidates they're equally nice in personal communication equally reliable in teaching equally uh, strong recommendation letters everything is the same right so they're looking at two people one of them is focusing in micro or just focusing right or has a field right? The other person in his CV has one paper in micro and one paper in macro. Whom would you choose, right? In my experience, a person with a field is more likely to be chosen, right? If there is a premium for focusing, right? the candidate's behavior should be consistent with that premium. If there is no premium, the candidate's behavior should be not con should be consistent with not having a premium, right? 
So how do universities respond to that? Well, they're looking at different people who focus and they're looking at people who don't focus and they're thinking, what is the chance of a person to be good if he's focusing? I know if there is a premium or not, right? And what is the chance for a person to be good if he is not focusing? Again, I know that he's responding to the optimal behavior of everybody. Now, since all the universities are the same, if one of the groups is better than another, the universities are more likely to hire from the group that's better. And that leads to whether it makes sense to have a market premium on hiring or not, right? So uh, as an example, right? Let's imagine the world thinks that uh, those who focus are smarter. And then universities look at people who come to them and they're saying, okay, here is the guy who is focusing. Here is the guy who is not focusing. I am gonna hire the one that's focusing. So those who focusing realize that there is a premium, the more likely chance of getting hired if they focus. And they think, okay, if there is a premium, I am going to behave optimally as a response to that premium. So the equilibrium will be when candidates are picking their CVs to responding to the market premium for focusing and universities are giving or not giving more likely uh, their hiring decision to those who focus based upon who is focusing. So you need consistency of the university choice and of the people's choice, okay? Then you get an equilibrium. Now, I have all three, param I have only three parameters in this work, three parameters, uh, three parameters. I have lambda, I have P, and I have alpha, all right? Um, I'm gonna alpha, lambda, sorry, lambda, and P. Okay. Maria, you are an experienced person in academics. I need your input. P is the probability that the person who is good in the field has a good idea. What's that number? person who is good in game theory comes up with a good idea in game theory. Okay, that's right. What do you mean, Tor? Do we, do we mean good idea or the paper that's going to be published going to be good? I can give you an option of giving me two different numbers or three or five or ten. Okay, uh, I, would, I would answer that in the following way. Uh, the probability of publishing good paper is close to one because if person is good no 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 getting a good idea no right? if you get a, if you get a good idea you, what what you are saying uh, is if you have a good idea you publish what i'm saying is if you have no idea and you go into the idea what's the chance of the new idea to be good okay let's let's put it sir zero point seven so that's uh, 0 0.7, okay? Mm -hmm. Alpha P, alpha times that, is the probability of a bad person to have a good idea. So for every bad person's idea, how many 
ideas would be good for a good person. So let, let's say for every two good ideas of the good person, you get one good idea from the bad person. So that would be 0 0.5. So this alpha is how much worse is the bad person compared to the good person? Let's make it 0 0.1. Okay. And lambda is the proportion of good people. Uh, 0 0.4. Uh, Leonid, are you with us? I am, but my mic was muted. Uh, How can I help, Sergey? Uh, what's your estimates about my parameters? That's wild guesses. I yeah, yeah, right yeah. I, absolutely. I cannot be of help. Let me okay, give Maria, me a wild guess. That's fine. Give me a wild guess. I, I repeat, Maria. So I think this is a reasonable <laughs> estimate. Thanks. So you fine. have sample of two. Fine. Uh, Bernardo, what's your take? Okay, so I would say P is 0.8. Okay. Um, alpha 0.4. So the good, the, the chance to get a good idea if you're bad is about 30%. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, lambda, so lambda is a proportion of good people. Yeah. I would say. Point three. Okay. So, yeah, let me call this Maria and Leonid. And this is Bernardo. And let's get a third one. Do you have a volunteer? Do we have a volunteer here? Victoria, the host. Huh? Victoria the host. I know that she wants to volunteer. Okay. Um, I would estimate uh, lambda as 1.2. Okay, 1.2. 1. 1. Oh, sorry, 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 uh, <laughs> 0. 0.2. Right. Um, alpha as uh, 1. Oh, 0. 0.1. Okay. And P uh, 0. 0.9. Okay. Okay. So what we did in, well, what I did uh, with, uh, as I said, the Yelp has nothing to do with it yet, was I took the chance of publishing an, in AR, okay? If you graduate from Princeton and uh, like there is a paper of Conley and Onder in Journal of Economic Perspectives, where they look at, I think, 10 years of graduates from all the universities, all top, top 30 universities in economics, in PhDs, and they're looking at their AER equivalents. And uh, the chance to have a, uh, the chance to have a, I, will, I can't remember where I, uh, to have two ARs and you need two ARs for a tenure was, no, 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 it was in here. So that was a 0 0.2. So that came, the P came from the paper of mine with Sasha Bagestanian, where we were estimating the chance of publishing an AR in your first 10 papers if you are in top 100 in RIPIAC and that was 0 0.3 if you graduate from Harvard okay and alpha we've got from uh, there is a paper of uh, Heckman and uh, Mokhtan relatively recent I think in Journal of Economic Literature it's coming out it, it, I think it came out already so what they did in there, they showed that you need to publish two top fives to get the tenure in the top 50. So one was not enough and three is too much. So we were looking at like what should be the alpha such that uh, publishing one 
would be not enough to be sure you are good. And publishing three would be too much to make sure that you are good. And the estimate from there was something like uh, 0 0.1 or something in here. My point here is that we are not in the model. We are not specifying what is being good. We are not specifying what is a good idea, depending upon the thresholds that you choose for yourself. So we chose publishing in AR as a measure of a good idea. And we chose uh, getting tenure in top 50 as a measure of uh, whether like getting tenure in top 50 as a measure of whether you're good okay so that's how we came up with these numbers other people can have other criteria of what is good what is the chance of having a good idea how good are good compared to bad right so there are different values I am going to switch back to, I hope it, it I, is it three, may, ah, let me save the picture in case it doesn't, doesn't save, right? And I'm going to go back to my presentation, right? So we have an equilibrium. Hopefully we have an equilibrium. If universities think that focus is not useful as a signal, we should not get that focused people are better. If universities think that focus is a good signal, focusing people should be better. There is obviously a world where focusing is a bad signal, but we are not gonna go there. So questions. If there is no premium for focus, who would focus? If there is a premium for focus, who would focus? Are people who focus better than people who don't focus? Conditional on whether you have a premium in equilibrium, right? And to answer that, we need to have the utility function for the candidate. So, yeah, candidate's decision-making. If there is no premium for focusing, then it doesn't matter what you put in your CV, right? How do you choose what to put in your CV? You put good papers in your CV, right? You like to work on good papers. What's the point of working in bad papers? If you have good papers, you work at good papers, right? Now, imagine you have four good ideas. Two good ideas in topic one and two good ideas in topic two. What's your chance to focus? Well, you pick them at random, right? So what's the chance to not focus? Well, you take one from one field and you take one from another field. And the chance of that is two thirds. So you're not focusing if your all of your ideas are good, right? If if your all ideas are good, you pick one by random and another by random and you don't focus. That's if there is no premium for focus, right? So you focus with a chance of one third. So there is a chance of one sixth that you pick two papers from the same topic. And there is a chance of one sixth that you're picking two ideas from the same topic. Similar story happens if none of your ideas are good. You just pick two papers at random, right? Because you're not gonna get hired if you don't work at any papers, right? No matter how smart you are, it doesn't matter what your ability is, right? No matter what is your ability, the hiring people are still only looking at your CV, right? So if you're, all of your ideas are good, right? The chances that you're not focusing. If all of your ideas are bad, same story, right? The only person, the only type, well, the only CV which will always be focused are people 
who are good, who are who have a good idea and a good idea, and both of them are in the same topic. Every other type, every other type will get you a two-thirds chance of not focusing, except the types which have two good ideas in one of the topics. And these guys will focus on those. And these guys are likely to be good in that topic, right? Because it's more likely that you will get a good idea if you're good. So these guys, as an opposite Bayesian thing, these guys are more likely to be good at topic one. And that's what drives our result, number one. So result number one is that if there is no premium for focusing, those who focus are better than those who are not focusing. Why? Because there is everybody, right? So when you're looking at focusing, you have, you have pretty much the whole population, except those who are good in both ideas. Everybody else does that. And these guys who are likely to be good in their field, they are focusing. So if you don't reward people and they choose top and they choose ideas at random, choosing the good ideas first, what you get is that those who focus are better. And if there is a premium for focusing, those who don't focus are better than those who focus. If the chance of having a bad idea is high enough. Okay, how does that work? If there is a premium for focusing, ideas get chosen among good ones if possible and focusing if able. So this guy can focus right so he definitely focuses he chooses one of the two topics this guy cannot focus because if he focuses he needs to work on a bad idea he needs to drop one of the good ideas and somebody else will do his good idea and he won't be able to follow it up right <coughs> so this guy does not focus everybody else everybody else focuses only people with one good idea in micro and one good idea in macro focus, uh, not focus. This guy focuses on topic one. That should say on topic one. The guy who has zero, 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 zero focus on either topic with equal probability. Okay, so if there is a premium for focusing, those who don't focus are better than those who focus because those who don't focus have one good idea in micro and one good idea in macro so they are good in at least one topic okay so that's what i call an adverse outcome when you reward people for focusing those who don't focus are better but when you don't reward for focusing those who focus are better in the picture that's how it looks like. So that's alpha, that's P, right? That star is my parameterization that I had. It's always an other selection. So what did we use? What, what numbers did we choose? You guys can still just see my presentation, right? You don't see anything else that I'm showing. Just the presentation, right? uh screen sharing whiteboard yeah so we had alpha lambda p 0 0.1 0 0.4 0 0.7 0 0.4 0 0.3 0 0.8 0 0.1 0 0.2 0 0.5 all right so Maria gave us the P of 0 0.7 and alpha of 0 0.1. So we are somewhere here. So 1.1 times 0 0.7, you get 
seven, uh, 0 0.77. So that's below the border. So that's uh, like, like here somewhere, right? P times one plus alpha is less than one. Alpha P times, should be the other way around, right? That should be P. No, P is one. This, this graph is weird. This graph is really weird. I need to check the graph. Yeah. All right. So P times one plus alpha bigger than one does not work for Maria's numbers. Uh, 0 0.8 times 1.4, that should work. So for Bernardo, that seems to be working. And for Valeri, we've got 0 0.9 times 1.1, we get 0 0.99. So pretty much on the border. Uh, Bernardo, what was the rationalization for your numbers? So I'm specifically mostly surprised about alpha of 0 0.4. Was there something like, uh, was it literally I, the first time somebody gets it above the border? Ah, uh, no, just, uh, I, I guess it just I nice was numbers. Okay. too optimistic about uh, uh, bad people getting lucky and getting good ideas more often. Uh, that right. was the whole rational point. Right. Which was clearly wrong. Uh, no, it's not wrong, it's just, uh, yeah. I had a guy who was saying uh, P is one, but then the alpha was like 0 0.1, which kind of, you know, made sense because like goodness, right? But yeah, so this is a pretty big space. The space of always adverse is pretty big in here. But this result says, if universities are looking for people to be good at something, right, they should somehow reconcile their desire for better people with giving rewards to better people. And it's hard to break it talking about, say, propensity to specialize, right? If good people liked to specialize, right um less than bad people it is a mathematical equilibrium right but it's not a meaningful equilibrium right so if they are all indifferent between specialization and specialization but just by sheer chance good people behave differently from bad people it's not you know there is probably a criterion to, of ideal games or whatever that, 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 that would remove this equilibrium completely. Right, it, it's hard to get rid of that. So one way of getting rid of that is to say, well, maybe universities want somebody who is good in topic one. Maybe I want a micro person. And there is a chat person. Oh, the chance to have a good idea and the chance to have a good idea and the published papers are different. Yes, but I assume it's one. The chance of publishing a good idea is one. Good people have no incentive to publish bad ideas. Well, bad people have no incentives to publish bad ideas as well, right? As in, um, as in, I suspect there are people who are purely motivated by money, okay? If everything can be resolved with money, then there is no point in doing that. Just pay a bunch of money to people to behave well, right? I think we as a profession are motivated uh, to do a good job as well. So like in my world, you cannot pay people money to convince them to do a bad job. In a couple of slides, we'll go into that, into making people to do a bad job, and there will be a reason for that. But, uh, like, we, 
are not in the world where admins are trying to make you publish whatever. We are in the world where admins want to hire a good person. They don't care about your publications at all. Okay? The only reason why they look at your publications is because they know that good people want to, is because they know that everybody wants to work at good ideas because of this innate desire to work at good ideas. They don't care about people who just want to publish for money. It's not like you're wrong. <laughs> it's just the world where you can pay people money and resolve everything is too easy to model. I want to make the work harder on myself. I want to explain why there are people who are not focusing. Right? I want to make sense out of non-compliance with clearly more profitable world. Okay? So I guess if you have, say, 1% of people like in my world and 99% of people who are just motivated by money, there is not going to be a lot of difference. And here's why. So there is an average overall of over everybody, right? Let's say the liking of money, right? The liking of money is just coming independently from the ability, which might or might not be true, but let's say it's independent. When one group of people who focus, right, is better than the another group of people who don't focus, the average overall is between these two groups, right? And the average of those who are only motivated by money is going to be between these two groups. And in my results, it's the wrong people who are better if you motivate people with money, it's the non-focusing first people who have become better. And if you motivate people with money, it's the non-focusing people who become better. So if you add the motivation of people with money, if you take people who don't care about good or bad papers, who are just publishing whatever is paying more, right? They will only make the gap smaller, but which group is on top focusing or not focusing, it will not change that. So yes, I can, I, as, if ability is not correlated with loving money, I think it's not breaking my result. If it is correlated, yes, it's breaking my result. But as long as not caring about money is independent from the ability, I think the result remains the same. Thank you for that. That was super useful. I need to be explicit about that. So add people. Okay, if I may, we are, uh, oh, we yeah, are go ahead. Uh, running a bit late. So I would like to leave some time for discussion. What right. are your plans? How much time you need to All right. wrap up the presentation? I, I, let me then just say that I have a couple of different results. If you are only looking for a micro person, would you rather choose a focusing person on micro or not focusing person? And the answer is the same, except the graph is now different. So now Maria's point is here, and you need a high enough lambda for the world to be not adverse. Bernardo's point is still here, and Valerie's point is about here. So you guys need a high enough proportion of good people in the environment for your story to work. My story does not work. My, the way how I estimated the point, no matter what is lambda, it doesn't work. For you guys, that depends upon where is the threshold and I didn't have an explicit formula for the threshold. So I kind of have a puzzle that says, if you reward focusing, non-focusing people are better. And if you don't reward focusing, focusing people are better how that can be reconciled with, uh, with the world. Then you're track, right? How to make this work? Here's how. In this one-shot model, right? People like good papers, 
because they want to work on that, they want to publish them, right? They are motivated with papers. If we think that people like the lifetime publishing, right? The total amount of publishing eventually, uh, you want to motivate them to self-select into a good group, right? So right now, if you motivate them to focus and they don't focus, they might be good and they are very likely to be good. So how do you convince them to focus? Well, you give them tenure track. You're saying, I am not hiring everybody. I am hiring people who do two papers for tenure, right? You get a higher chance of getting accepted to tenure track if you focus right if you don't get hired you get you go into the industry and you never publish if you go into tenure track you get some more time you come up with more ideas maybe you publish later right if you get two papers you get the tenure so in this world if the tenure track time is long enough for you to come up with a new good idea you will choose to be hired for tenure track because now you have an opportunity to come up with a new good idea instead of another idea in the field that you gave up in, right? If you were a guy with one good idea in micro and good idea in macro, you want to focus on micro or macro, doesn't matter, right? And you want to lose one paper to get the better chance of being hired to get a chance of coming up with a new good idea, to get a tenure and publish more ideas later. Okay, so there is a price of new papers that you're gonna publish after tenure. And only those who are good will choose to drop one of the good papers because they think they will be able to come up with a new good idea. And those who are bad in both topics they will not focus. And then you have consistency of everything because good people will focus even if that requires them to drop one of the good ideas because then they have a more likely chance of getting these other ideas to publish because if they don't get hired, they don't get to publish, they don't get to do anything, right? And bad people, they would rather have a smaller chance of getting hired but they want to guarantee themselves the tenure so they don't focus, okay? So average ability of those who don't focus is lower because it's exactly zero, because all of them are bad. So this way, this, this tenure track motivation of this puzzle completely resolves everything. It doesn't matter what alpha lambda P is, focusing people are good well, relatively good. There is still a bunch of people who are not good at anything, but they are better than people who don't focus because people who don't focus, they don't want to give up their one good idea because they think they will not come up with another one in the tenure time. Which brings me to my final point. You have two worlds, right? You have the US world of eight years tenure track and you have the UK world of one year of tenure track, right? In the US world, it's clear why focusing is important. In the UK world, it's more like my basic model where you don't have a chance of coming up with one more idea. So in the UK world, caring about focusing is weird. In the US world, it's not weird because there is tenure that makes sense. Yeah, there is a bunch of math. There is a bunch of induction that, yeah. I need to kind of brush, but yeah, the point of the paper is that we think there is a weird decision making about caring about who focuses and who doesn't. We think it makes sense if you consider the US style tenure and uh, maybe if you, if you think that there is a high chance of having good ideas if you are bad, then it makes sense to reward focusing in the UK style world as well. But otherwise, yeah.
we 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 we, we kind of need to bend it into a nice nice figure like you know in 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 michelangelo's world we need to chop off the extra stuff to make it beautiful we we know there is a beautiful thing inside we just need to cut out the ugly stuff from the outside to keep on with the beautiful stuff okay thanks very much sergey and make sure you send it to hiring committees of all economic departments <laughs> to, to change the their world. to change their wicked ways of <laughs> Also, <laughs> there seems to be a persistent market failure. We still have a bit of time for discussion, so please, uh, are there any comments, any questions? I'm sure there should be some. Anything goes, honestly. Anything goes, right. Well, while we're still waiting, my uh, immediate comment is that sometimes departments care about having uh, a balanced uh, faculty composition in that uh, there is a perception that we are strong in some fields, and there are gaps in others. Uh, like uh, we have plenty of good field, uh, good people in applied uh, micro, but we are running low on macro econometrics. Right. In which case, <clears throat> uh, other than uh, other things being equal, they try to hire people who have strong uh, results in one particular field, and uh, they would downplay the talent. I think at that point, so that may be one more reason to focus. Uh, because sure. that will give you stronger chances to fill a particular gap that some departments might have. So that's the second couple of results is exactly about people choosing between who is focusing in micro and people who don't focus. So that's the point of this second graph in here. I mean, yes, uh, uh, it's not exactly what you're saying because what you're saying is you'd rather have somebody who knows macro than having a good person. Well, you know, if you want to, if you want to be a, a, a well-balanced department, you should have people in different fields. And if sure, sure, sure. for the some other reasons thing, the there other are thing some gaps, that, uh, focus might, might be helpful. The other thing that you might be uh, touching here is that sometimes you have micro people and you have macro people and they're fighting. And say macro per people have now a macro job, right? And they don't want to hire somebody who is not a macro person. They don't want to strengthen the other group. So they would rather go for somebody who is worse, but definitely from their group, than for somebody better who is like reinforcing the opposite group, which uh, is different from like benevolent university kind of world that we all want to live in. But uh, it's definitely uh, happened in more than one department where I worked. What if we extend to your model the possibility of co-authorship when both strong and weak faculty might benefit from cooperation? Uh, collaboration is super complicated. Like the problem is not even, not like, it's even like, let's say me and Darren Asimoglu wrote a paper, right? And we published it in JP, right? I'll get zero acknowledgement for that right <laughs> even if i did all the work right so so there is there are there are like things of uh it's harder to attribute i i want to play a bit with that and i want to have like dimensions of ability and seniority and all this kind of stuff it's just not immediate it's 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 too much maybe i'll come up with something soon enough i mean this one took me a couple of years but i'll i'll i'll, I'll try <laughs> candidate okay. did not include several papers in his cv and the university can check this is it a good or bad signal for the university is it important that candidates do not include those papers on cv i know people who don't include publications in their cv I know people who don't include workplaces in their CV. Okay, so sometimes it pays off. I mean, candidates think it pays off. If you look at Harvard people who go on the market, frequently they have only working papers. They either have working papers or they have AR publications or, you know, revising and submits or whatever. They will never, they will never put an economics bulletin in there. Even if they had an economics bulletin, they would rather not mention it. They will hope that nobody's gonna Google for them. If somebody discovers that, that's, you know, a reason for ridicule, but 
it's it's like you know you can have an AR or you can have an AR papers and proceedings. Some people say AR and they don't write papers and proceedings. Is that a terrible thing? It's it's funny, but it's you know it's not it's not a crime. Some people say economic theory as a journal. Some people say economic theory bulletin, and they omit the bulletin and just put economic theory. And it's 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 incredibly uh, inefficient, I would say. If that's the difference between things, it's not it's not worthy of of, of digging in that. But um, answering your precise question, is that important that candidates do not include all papers in the CV? I know a lot of people. Uh, let me give you an example. Steven Zille, right? So there is a Steven Zille who wrote a bunch of papers with uh, Deidre McCloskey about how to write papers. He went on the market with Journal of Economic Literature, right? He's got a publication in Journal of Economic Literature. Other people came to him and said, you need to drop the Journal of Economic Literature from your CV so that you have a better chance of having a job. And would you drop a Journal of Economic Literature from your CV? No. <laughs> so, so, so he didn't. And he got a job like in Washington, St. Louis or something. But point being, I don't think it was malicious advice. I think it was a real advice of people who were like, I mean, normal person should publish in the ER and that, that, that could hurt you. And maybe it hurt a little. I don't know. I definitely know that people are hiding their papers. People are hiding their employment. People are hiding their uh, uh, master degrees that they failed. Right? Sometimes people write their uh, honorary doctors declined, so they got the honorary doctor, but they decided to decline it and they write about it in this CV. So CV games are funny. Let me, let, let, let me make a short version of that. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Anyone else, please? Um, I have uh, one question. Sure. Um, is it possible and feasible to add some heterogeneity to the demand side like to universities like uh, i don't know i'm thinking that for example like harvard university could aim to hire one person who is like the best at micro and the best at macro mm -hmm. but some middle tier university will be more realistic and maybe try to aim for someone who is only good at one field but uh, if they get a candidate good at two fields i think okay i cannot realistically get this person i don't know if it makes any sense in your model or not uh, uh, I like the simplicity of lexicographic preferences. So right now my preferences are lexicographic with respect to quantity of good papers and money. If I have Harvard paying more, right? I need to somehow balance the monetary benefit of more likely employment, right? And monetary benefit of Harvard paying. So which one is bigger? And I go like into more of this world where money is continuous. And then I need to come up with like heterogeneity of how much people like money and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I guess it's not hard, but it opens a can of worms that would lose me my parsimoniousness and gain me not a lot. I mean, there is plenty of papers that say if lambda is big and gamma is small and theta is between one and two and, you know, yes. <laughs> right now, what they have is a very simple model that has, you know, one line in, in, in the space of two dimensions. I, I think I can work in that regard. It's just, I don't think I'll get a lot of clear predictions. I will try to play with that. Maybe I'll get something. So Harvard wants both guys, right? He wants good in topic one and good in topic two. I'll think about it. My immediate reaction is that it's probably going to require me to change it into significantly uglier mode. Thank you. Thanks. Please. Any, any further questions? Uh, Maria, please. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, very interesting exercise and idea. 
And, but I still have her comment on the wording of her coming up with a good ideas or bad okay. ideas, because I think there are two different issues. First, to come up with idea, which might be good or bad, and you can't regulate it. If you are good, most of your ideas are good. If you are bad, most of your ideas are bad. It's, like, it's life. But the decision to publish a paper, it's a different story. Because about each idea, you make your own decision. Do you want to publish it or not? Okay. And uh, you might decide that uh, every idea should be published, or you decide that you only publish good ideas, or I don't know, you have some strategies on that. And mm -hmm. those strategies depend on your incentives, which are provided by department incentive, etc. So mm -hmm. when you explain coming up with ideas, I would probably uh, say it in the ways of publishing papers, not coming up with ideas. Again, because you can't control that. Or I misunderstood something here. That's right. why I did numbers like this, because uh, if you are good, you shouldn't have incentive. In a good equilibrium, you shouldn't have incentives to publish bad papers. Right. If you should be close to one. Right. So I guess my point here is that there is all these stories about which papers to publish and which papers don't publish. And they are parallel to everything we are discussing here. So what here, what we are working on here, is the intellectual pleasure of having a good idea. So people are mostly motivated with having good ideas for themselves. They are not transforming them into money. I have lexicographic preferences between having ideas and money. Okay. So in the second part with tenure track, right, I'm using the higher chance of getting employed as a way of comparing different quantities of good ideas. So I have the expected utility where you only care about ideas. You like having good ideas, right? There is world where you have, where you manipulate your portfolio of good and bad ideas into publications and how does that gives you grants and uh, students and whatever, right? We don't care. The other way of thinking about it is maybe you want to have a Nobel Prize. Good ideas give you Nobel Prizes. Maybe that gets published in economic letters, right? But if it's a Nobel Prize worthy good idea, it's a Nobel Prize worthy good idea. It will be noticed, it will be cited, it will be used, right? So I agree that in a lot of activities, what gets published is important. I do empirical work in that, right? But in what I model, I think think I want to abstract away from motivating people with money. Like you cannot pay people in, I, I want to talk about people who don't focus when you pay the money to focus. And if it's like I am not focusing so that later I can convert it into more money that you are paying me now, right? That, that's still motivating you with money. <laughs> it's, it's the same. It's just, it's just it's an, it becomes an exercise in accounting. It's a complicated accounting, but at the end of the day, it's still money, right? So I kind of want to stay in this marvelous world where people are motivated with having good ideas. I understand that I might explain more things if I <laughs> do the accounting thing, but if the message of my paper is that it doesn't make sense to reward people for focusing in the world where we take focusing as a signal about ability, Okay, then I probably made a sufficiently good job in explaining that paying for publications does not give you good people. 
Okay. All right. Well, so I'm, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm afraid this is all that yeah. we have time for tonight. Uh, let me just make sure that uh, there is no one else who wants to continue or to follow on what. I mean, so I kind of want to continue, but oh, I, course, I think but I got yeah, myself yeah. confused on that. But you, but, the, the, but the, the beauty of talking with Masha is that uh, she asks stuff, and then you 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 learn about yourself and you learn about the world, and just, but, just uh, uh, replying but, to something very straightforward, like, "Why do you not care about publication?" They're like, ah. but we should <laughs> follow on uh, we should follow on what you preach. We should focus. Sure. Sure. All right. So, uh, thanks very much, Sergey. It was quite. Uh, interesting and eye-opening. Uh, our <clears throat> our next seminar in a week from now will have Samitra Jha from uh, Stanford Business School, and he is going to present his recent work on how to reconcile conflicts by creating joint ownership of financial assets. The title is "Sorts into Bank Shares." <clears throat> on that point, I want to wish everyone good night, and we'll meet again in a week. Thanks so much to everyone. Thanks, everybody. That was very Sergei. enjoyable. Thanks, everybody. Okay. It was very enjoyable. Good luck. Hope. Stay safe. I'll, I'll bring back everything that you gave me today in the other presentations in this year. Thank you. Please. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>